So super excited to be here today. And starting off, Margaret, um, we just heard from Marion, you did grow up in, in rural Germany. Yes. Um, then you moved to the States. What led you to start up Outcast? So I moved to the United States. Uh, I fell into tech. It was a complete accident. There was no plan involved. Um, but I was temping while in school, and I ended up working for the German general manager of an American startup, which for those of you old enough, which I bet there's no one, uh, it competed with Silicon Graphics, which was one of the major companies of its time. So that's how I got to the US. And then uh, I had a job for about four years at another firm. And then I co-founded the Outcast Agency with my co-founder, Karen Marooney, who is now at Facebook. And um, the reason we did it is th there's a bit of a genetic reason. Either someone is driven to have their own company and kind of put a little bit of a mark on the world. Um, and also, timing was pretty good. It was in 1997. If you remember, Netscape had gone public in 1995. So that ushered in this big boom, which later busted. Um, so there, there was lots of fertile ground. And one of our first clients ended up being a company called Salesforce.com, which I'm sure you all know. So that helped us build a business around um, that client and then many others, including Facebook and whatnot. Yeah. And so then what led you from Outcast to A16Z? So I had um, run Outcast along with my co-founder for 14 years. In, in that 14 years, we had sold the business to a small holding company. So there was no real change to the business. And I very much still kind of consider Outcast as my non-human child. I've, I've one bio child, but the other one is Outcast. But I also did know how to do it. And when Ben and Mark first, when I first met them, they just kind of grilled me, told me nothing <laughs> about what they were up to. And then later they said, like, we're going to raise $300 million and it'll be the two of us, which was a bit daunting because that was right as the financial crisis had hit. So they were raising money the spring after the fall of 2008. I'm like, the two of you, $300 million. And Marcia says, let's assume success, shall we? So I represented them for the first year and then later, they asked me to join the firm. And since I had done the Outcast job, which I very much loved for 14 years, I, I, I loved it, but I also didn't know how to do it. Against that, Andreessen Horowitz is now you know, one of the uh, better known brands in venture capital, but that wasn't obvious. Uh, it wasn't obvious that that could happen because if you have paid any attention, the ranking of VC firms doesn't usually shift around a lot. It's, you know, it's Sequoia and it's Kleiner and this and that, and it's not really, it's not easy to break into. And I thought that would be an interesting challenge, and I also believe that the founders and then the subsequent partners had the sort of the, dis the, the ambition one to be at the top firm and then also the discipline to see it through. So there's no golfing, no vineyards. <laughs> it's basically all work all the time. So that's why I did it. That's cool. And um, TransferWise was one of A16Z's first investments in Europe. Not the first, but one of the first. So the first investment in Europe was actually not a venture investment. Um, it was the buyout of Skype um, that we did with Silver Lake and the Canadian Pension Board, I think. Um, so that kind of made people pay attention because it was an unusual deal. I think people's expectation was like, we'll be seed investors because Mark and Ben had done that on their own. Um, so the Skype investment was great, and then it paid off, I think, in 18 months, about two years. Um, um, it was a nice return, so that, that helped us um, get taken seriously. Actually, sillyly, that, so that's how we know about TransferWise, right, because those were ex-Skypees. And then Ben passed on the deal, I think twice, maybe? but finally corrected this ridiculous mistake, and now we are an investor in TransferWise, and very happily so. So I had the joy of working with A16 because of um, my TransferWise experience, but maybe, um, can you talk a bit about what's different about A16 to other VCs, because it is a very different experience working with you guys. Yeah, so the way, so one of the ways um, to break into the top five, top three ranking of VC firms is like we say, what are we going to say about ourselves? Because usually the way firms market themselves is, well, A, they don't actually market themselves. It's a bit of a black box, or it used to be, right? And then number two, 
what they, their calling card are all the other deals that they've done. So if you're in the lucky position of being Sequoia, which is a fantastic firm, you can go like, oh, and then we did Apple, and then you know, we did this other deal, and, and Google, and whatnot. Well, we didn't have any of that. But what we did have is we sort of had this belief that we were going to put the founding entrepreneur first um, if they want to learn how to be a CEO and want to run the company for the longest time. And the, we had that belief because if you look at all the big companies that are successful over decades, that tend to be founder run. Now, not every founder wants that or can make it, but like that was the, the belief. Now, okay, so if you're gonna go like, okay, you have product genius, you don't know how, be, how to be a CEO, we'll take that bet any time of the day because it's, product genius is kind of binary. You have it or you don't, right? And it's more, becoming a CEO is more learnable than developing product genius. So the entire firm, is organized around like, okay, so if you take that profile of a founder, what will they need? So they probably know, if they're a first time founder, right, like they probably know a bunch of fellow engineers that they've gone to school with, they may know some other folks, but they tend to not know the talent networks of like, okay, it's time to hire a CFO, how do I do that, right? So we have a talent agency. They tend to maybe not have a lot of experience in considering uh, an offer to be bought or to buying a company. So we have a corporate development team. So we have all these folks. We have about 100 people who have expertise in a particular field, and their job is to, have, to be available to the founders to go like, okay, how do I think about this? And then plug me into your network, right? So our, my... Uh, colleague Jeff Stump, who runs our executive talent network, when his CEO comes, like, I need an independent board member. We're like, okay, here are the profiles of some, meet, you know, a few, here's a search firm that I can connect you with, right? So the founder gets to plug into both the expertise and the network. And then my bucket is the marketing stuff, which is primarily actually aimed at marketing the firm, because we won't find people like you to want to raise money from us. Right? But then it also is when a founder needs to think about big moments, for example, I'm launching the company or a big competitor just entered the field or God forbid, we kind of screwed up, we have a bit of a crisis, that's when we get involved and help them out. Well, the advice tends to be sort of situationally specific. Um, there are some golden rules. One is um, I think people, um, most companies at the early stage, you know, C to A, often to B, they languish in obscurity. That's just the fate that befalls most of them. So I think a lot of people just don't even get to be noticed. And if you want to sell enterprise software to a top flight company with an important CIO, they kind of want to know that you exist. You want them to know that you exist and you want them to believe that you're going to be around for a really long time. So I think just taking the function seriously, I think is step number one. Um, against that, try not to go out and be out and loud too early because, you know, Product is everything, right? Like, I don't do product, but like without a product, there is, there is nothing else. So focus on the product, but then also make sure that you ha occupy a rightful place in people's minds, right? And of course, that advice will change drastically on when to launch and how to launch, whether you're a consumer company or a B2B company. That's all different. Now, in this climate, um, you know, I've been around for a while, <laughs> and things go in cycles. And right now, the cycle is very much, um, there's some headwinds against technology. People are worried about privacy, you know, there's been security breaches, people are worried about inclusion, all those kinds of things, right? So um, in this climate, just make sure that you find the folks who um, will give you a fair shake and um, who you can tell that story to appropriately. And then the other thing that I found has been incredibly useful is in addition to you know, having the indirect channel of reporters and bloggers and analysts and all of that, who are very, very important, 
It is also important to have your own content because there are lots of stories that you know, a Bloomberg or a Wired will never care about, but that are important for your customers to hear, that you want your employees to know about. So it is very good to have your own content. And that can take lots of different forms. It can be, you know, you have your own conference, you have your own industry event. It can be you have um, blog posts, you're active on social media. You know, we did this podcast that is now, I think, four or five years old that's been incredibly successful. And those are not to compete with media, but that is so that we can tell stories that our entrepreneurs find interesting or regular leaders want to be aware of that are outside what might be written up in Fortune. The joy of your own content is you get to control your own story. You get to control your own story. You get to be you know, a bit nerdier than, um, than maybe you can be in, in other outlets. And um, it also is a good, um, um, a, you, you have then the, the, the ability to play defense. So I like to play offense, but every once in a while there might be a story or there might be a rumor going around, there might be whatever. But if you have your own channel, you can correct that and you can set the record straight on your terms. And um, what about some of the pitfalls that you see uh, founders regularly fall into? Uh, regularly is a tricky uh, fault. I think the sort of the, the tricky thing, I think, you know, it gets a bit to founder psychology. To will something into existence that hasn't been there before, you kind of have to suspend disbelief. And you, you run counter to everybody's telling you that's a stupid idea and this will never work. And, all that kind of stuff. So you have to suspend disbelief. You also have to paint a bigger vision than what you're doing today, right? Like, we don't invest in companies because of what the code that they've written today. We invest in, in sort of two things, like if it works, how large a company can it be, right? And we invest in the, the entrepreneur and their potential. And along the same lines, if you're gonna try to hire people, you have to paint a larger vision than what it is that you're doing today. So you have, to, you have to walk that line, and I think that's a tricky line to walk, because at the same time, you don't want to overpromise and not deliver, right? So it's easy to go like, oh my god, we're going to change the world. By the way, nobody should say that in this climate. If you say the word, you say oh, we're going to change the world, people just, like, their eyes glaze over, at least in the United States. <laughs> Um, but the vision needs to be larger than where you are today, but you can't get over your skis so far that you cannot grow into it in a reasonable time frame. Same thing with valuation, right? I think that's a, that's a real lesson that I've definitely learned and I see a lot in startups is the, uh, the difference between reality and the mission. Yes. And there is a, there's, a, there's a healthy gap, um, which is okay, but mm -hmm. then when the hype really outstrips reality, then you've got a serious problem. Yes, yeah, so then you end up you know, in a Theranos type of situation, which is obviously a very extreme example. But you, you, do, you do need to go like, you know, we want to be this. You know, we want to be the largest community that you know, helps people belong together in an Airbnb situation, right? But like, the, the detail, the devil is in the detail, right? You don't want to commit to shipping time frames. You don't want to inflate your numbers ever. Ever right? There's no there's no reason to do that. So, okay to paint a big vision, but like on the details, do not do not overpromise time frames, sizes, numbers, because they will just come back to bite bite you. And then you're that company, right? Like the we should never be defined by the worst thing that we've done. But once you get the write up that says you know that's the company that lied about X that just tends to follow you around in a very painful way. And, and really, you don't need to do it. And it will get mentioned in every piece. Yes, they all, they repeat, repeat, repeat. Yes. Yeah, that's the joy of the uh, internet now. Um, and so when entrepreneurs are dealing with media, what kind of pieces of advice can you give them for dealing with media? Okay, this sounds very simple, but I have had to say this sometimes, is don't lie. Don't, just don't freaking lie. Am I, am I allowed to swear? I don't know. Uh, don't lie, just for emphasis. Um, and there's sort of little lies. Oh, you know, I can't talk right now because X. Like, just don't, just don't go there, right? Don't, don't, don't say, like, that is not true. Something is not true. They get to ask the question. You get to 
answer, you get to answer what you want. You don't have to answer, but once you're trapped in a lie, you're just in big trouble because the, the relationship between, um, just like with customers, right? The relationship between anyone you do business with at the end of the day is going to be built on trust. And you break that trust, you have, that's a big hole to dig yourself out of. Yes, so I hear this a lot. Um, of course, our founders are perfect, all of them. Uh, so I don't hear this from our founders. Um, but they, they oftentimes sort of this thing where, well, I don't want to talk to that person, they're stupid. And I've never, ever heard an entrepreneur call a customer stupid. And I'm sure some of them are not brilliant. So it's just like attitudinally, it sets you up for failure to just go into a potentially productive um, relationship with that kind of attitude. Any reporter who doesn't get you, it is on you to explain yourself better. And that's sometimes, sometimes very tricky to do. We have half of our portfolio is sort of deep tech wonky stuff. They're not all drones and whatnot. So the bar is just higher to explain yourself. But there, there, there are freelance writers who can help with that. There are, you know, people like Joe who can help with that. There, there's, there's people who can help you do that. Um, so you alluded to it earlier, it's been an interesting uh, time for the tech sector. Um, there are interesting headlines all the time. Every what week, are you talking day. about? Um, we're only seeing one article. <laughs> um, it's been crazy. And I think you know, even you know, the movies coming out now are painting tech entrepreneurs as evil geniuses. Mm -hmm. Well, I will just one say there is sort of the, the um, things go in waves, right? And I think people tend to want to see trends. So you know, I used to get the questions like, "What does Silicon Valley need to learn from the Theranos situation?" And I'm like, "What does Theranos need to learn from the Theranos situation?" Like they're, they're not all the same. And in my experience, most folks in this audience, most folks that I work, they work really hard. They try to do something productive, and so. That's just it. And when, when the press waves go so negative, you have your own content outlet. There are probably reporters who still are trying to learn really honestly what you're, what you're doing. And if you have nothing to hide and nothing to apologize for, then you're good to go. There is a bit, I don't know if this is the same in the UK, but in the US there's sort of this, everybody is so apologetic about what they do all the time, which I don't, I don't quite get. I think, you know, the, I'm, a, I'm obviously pro-tech, I'm a big believer in that um, a lot of the problems that pre people are trying to work on are important, they're going to be useful, there's a great benefit of what tech does, and, and a lot of times it's sort of humans and what they do with tech that um, get us into trouble. Um, but yeah, there we have it. The cycle will change, um, and then we'll all go back to normal. And do you think Well, so venture capitalists, um, I think, are often viewed as being way more um, powerful and important. Um, I would actually say it's the founders themselves who are very much in the driver's seat, starting from founder control to, like, you, you like, I can give you advice, but it's, it's going to be your decision, it's your company, you're going to have to run it. So there, there's no one who will, like, solve this problem for you in particular. Now, what we can do in the role that we have, since we sit at a, on an interesting perch, we see across companies, we see across tech trends. So what I try to do for the firm on behalf of technology in general and Silicon Valley is just to do the best possible job that we can do to explain how it works, to explain the possible benefits, and to just be sort of a positive voice of technology which I think is sorely missing right now. Yeah, that we're sorely missing balance. I think. Yes, that's true. Yeah. That's, that's exactly right. And so, um, and recently where it's um, mainly invested in the US, um, have you noticed any differences between uh, your US portfolio companies and your European portfolio companies, or the Europe approach to tech? Um, I don't know that I'm qualified to answer this question because we have not done as many um, investments in Europe. And it's not because we don't like Europe. Um, 
I'm from here, uh, but um, it's also very nice in London, I will say. It's just that um, if you if you look at you know we have so many general partners, and what they do is basically they pick companies, they sit on boards, and you know they try to find the next major technology franchise. And for everyone here, there's just 30 or more in Silicon Valley. So there's this opportunity cost of like, do you fly all the way over there and all of that? Eventually, we might get to a place where we have an office here, hopefully um, run by folks that are in this community. What I find super encouraging is that um, there have been some successes. Um, Skype is an excellent example, right, where um, folks have been part of Skype and then now is a Skype mafia in, in the good sense. There's this network of folks. They're doing angel investing. And I think the more successes that are native European, the more the landscape will change. And I think we would all greatly benefit from having multiple Silicon Valleys right, spread all across the world. It is the one place where we have history and you guys don't, which is just ironic, right? We're sitting in this beautiful old building, but yeah, Silicon Valley just has a 60-year head start of this beautiful combination of the universities, the money, the, frankly, the weather. It's a very attractive place to live. People want to live in California, right? And this very, very, very high tolerance for, for risk, right? We just heard... Um, um, a chat about a failure, and why I like to aim for success, I think that's a really fantastic thing, failure is tolerated. Like, you you know, there are, there are entrepreneurs who are on their fourth journey, and you can raise money. And I don't want to speak for the UK, but like in Germany, if there's a bankruptcy on your resume, that ain't very good. So the risk tolerance, I just think, is just so much greater in Silicon Valley still. And I think the more the country, every country in Europe can kind of uh, develop more of a stomach for risk, the more breakout successes you will have. I think it is just a matter of time. And we're seeing um, like there's a couple of IPO, big IPOs coming out this year from Europe. I think that will help create that yes. kind of the mafia, the next, the next round, mm -hmm. basically, the next people who can invest. Um, going back to something we were talking about earlier, at what point um, do you think founders should start thinking um, so when you're still working on product, not so much. Um, you know, wh when when the company only has technologists as employees, like it's not time to think about it, right? Now you may find yourself in this interesting situation. Let's take uh, WhatsApp company. We did invest in WhatsApp. Just showed up on the scene. I think it was 13 people when Facebook bought it, right? And I'm sure they had some PR happening to them because it was such a runaway success. And in that case, you just get yourself an agency really fast and get their expertise and their connections and all that kind of stuff. But for the most part, if you're working on product and you're not looking at going to market, like, don't worry about it. When you do, do it properly. Um, engaging with press is a little bit like selling enterprise software. It's a relationship and it's a long sales cycle. It's not a transaction. It's not like they sit around waiting for you to call and take dictation. Right? They need to do a smell test, like, do I believe them? Do I trust the story? You know, get some game film on you, right? And then eventually it fits into a larger narrative and then you get written about. So do, do it properly, but it's okay to wait. You, you don't have to be. You know, the only reason, so I guess if you have funding from a um, firm with a good reputation, that's worth announcing, not for the money, who cares? Is for the recruiting ability, right? Like, but other than that, there, there's there's really there's no rush. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I totally agree. And I think if any founders out there uh, are thinking about where to start their own uh, PR activity, do listen to one of the podcasts on A16Z, the, the one you guys did that was PR 101, basically. Oh yeah, we did a podcast. We should do more podcasts on this topic because it's just easy to listen to while you're driving, which I do a lot. <laughs> So I would definitely listen to that. But now we've run out of time, so um, please join me in thanking Margaret for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.